On this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, I had the opportunity to go to Black and Tan Days in only Illinois. That's hard to say. Only Illinois. Anyway, I am not very well versed in the modern day black and tan and barely literate in the history of black and tans. So I recruited Jeff Wood to sit down and talk to me about black and tans, talk about his juice dog and uh, some of the, the older black and tans and where they came from and then what black and tan breeders are up to in 2022. Jeff and I go way back a long ways. We were hunting together in the western side of Indiana and eastern Illinois back in the early 1990s when he was campaigning the original Juice Dog. Jeff has been a lifelong black and tan fancier. You're going to want to listen all the way to the end in typical fashion. Once the recorder goes off, the good stories come out. And I'm not going to spoil it for you other than to say this story involves black and tan coon hounds gangsters and moonshine let's get that tailgate down and get the doors on the old south dog box thrown open and get some black and tans on the ground it's time to dump the box briar creek kennels is your complete hound hunting outfitter boots lights collars and tracking equipment dog boxes kennel supplies collars clothes squalors whoo they have it all briar creek kennel is a garmin and dog tree dealer Owner Chris Girth will ensure Briar Creek Kennel customers will get top of the industry customer service. Whether you purchase from their website or you find them at a major coonhound event, Chris and his staff will share expert knowledge and experience about every product they offer. Chris Girth is a top competitor and breeder of hounds. He knows what gear you need to be successful. Look for Briar Creek Kennels on the web for a complete online store or look at their fully stocked trailer at any major coonhound event. Briar Creek Kennels, offering a hound hunting public generations of excellence. How long have we known each other, Jeff? Well, I think we go back when we first start running around, running into each other at the mm-hmm. hunts. Back in the late 80s, I'm guessing. It had to be. Late 80s, early 90s. Yep. And... Uh, so I'm with Jeff Wood, and we're in Olney, Illinois at the Black and Tan Days, and Jeff and I go back a long time. You've been the sheriff of which county is that? Edgar County, Illinois. Edgar County for the last eight years. Yep. Going to run for another four? Yep, another four. Are you running unopposed? Nope. Got competition. Everybody oh. wants my job. <laughs> what, what's going to happen? You might retire this fall if you get beat, won't you? I might, yeah. Yeah. Have to coon hunt for a living. Yeah. Make some big money. There you go. There you go. So, yeah, the reason we're talking, I, I want to talk to you is because you've had you've had some pretty good dogs and been involved in black and tans for a long time. And, and uh, yeah, tell us tell us about the type of dogs you've been hunting all these years, Jeff. Yeah, well, I've, I've been hunting black and tans for uh, a little over 50 years, I guess. I've been to Black and Tan Association for just shy of 50 years. Uh, I'm probably the youngest old old member in the association. Right. Uh, joined when I was a kid. And back then, I eat and breathe black and tans. Uh, you know, I've always kind of liked to like to track dog. I still like to listen to dog run a track. Tree dog, uh, like a good mouth. But I, you know, a lot of guys say they don't care what a dog looks like as long as it can tree a coon. But I kind of still like to lead a lead a pretty dog, and I like to lead a pretty horse. So. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it's it's just as cheap to feed a good-looking one as it that's is right, a sorry that's one. Right. And they're out there. They're, that's right. And it, I've always found that if you got a dog that you like looking at, you'll put a little more into them. Yeah, you will. But you can also go back and say that they all look pretty good when they're doing their when, job when, right. When they're treated, they all look pretty. Yeah, yeah. So, But you have one dog in particular. Yeah. You had juice. And I had dogs back in the... Early 90s, Black Juice, bought him off a trade row. Uh, he was a grand show champion when I bought him. I made him a grand knight, a uh, high-scoring black and tan male in the world hunt. He was a all-around dog, good strike dog, uh, outstanding tree dog, slobber mouth. I know a lot of people have seen his ads and pictures. He had slobber all over him, running down his sides. Yeah. Uh, I had the foresight, I guess, or, or lucky, to collect him years ago. I just lived 25 miles from Dr. Scott, who was big into that at the time. Uh, 
stored up quite a bit of semen on him, so I'm still able to continue that line of dogs. I'm hunting second and direct sons and uh, grand pups of him right now, 30 years later. Yeah, we were talking about that. I mean, you, th you think about – that wasn't really talked about a lot back in the early 90s about, you know, drawing these dogs and storing semen and, and stuff like that. But, but you had a vet close to you that was already doing that right. sort of stuff. He was – Doc Scott was a pioneer in it, I think. He was affiliated with the University of Illinois at the time. Uh, he was a, you know, just kind of a founder of a lot of the artificial breeding, uh, frozen frozen semen, embryo transplants. Especially, I think dairy cattle was what he really got started in. Cattle. I was going to ask if he if he's doing other stuff dairy, too. Dairy cattle dogs. and then beef cattle was his big thing when when he started the dog business. The dogs were kind of a side side venture for him, but the cattle was his big big thing. But like I say, I was fortunate to live close to him. He he was raised in the same uh, part of the county I was. My my family and his family knew each other. Mm -hmm. I guess he kind of took me under his wing a little bit, and uh, so I got to spend a lot of time over there. I just my regret, like I told you earlier, was I should have spent every day I had free over there and, and learned it because I wouldn't have had to dealt with the public like I do now. Right. So let me ask you this: uh, Did you guys ever talk about? Like how long artificial insemination has been around, or did he ever talk about how long they, he had been doing it in cattle and livestock and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, he'd been. I mean, you know, we the dog stuff. I think Spring Creek Rock and and uh, of course Steve Kenny that had the Walker dogs. He he bought all the Spring Creek Rock semen back in them them days. He done a lot of a lot of business with Doc Scott. Doc done the uh, inseminating with the Spring Creek Rock stuff. But I think Spring Creek Rock had been done back in maybe the seventies, and I'm <clears throat> off the top of my head. I'm thinking Doc was doing the stuff with the cattle, you know, even years before that, because he'd talk about getting off in the evening, drive to Mississippi, and in inseminate a bunch of cattle, and drive home and be back to work the next day. Wow, yeah, I guess I was always pretty ignorant about it. I always thought it was like a, you know, late nine or nineties, twenty first century thing, but. But then, I guess no doubt I'm ignorant about it because then I find out that like hard time or uh, uh, spanky, right? The blue tick. There's spare there's spare time spanky. Yeah, spare time spanky. There's there's um, straws on him out there, mm -hmm. and that that would be you know Spring Creek Rock eras type yep. stuff. So, so tell me about Juice. What kind of dog was he? Juice was just, a, a, just a hunt him every night. I mean, I drew him a few times. Yeah, hunt him every night. He was just actually a, a, a pleasure dog. He was just just that a pleasure dog. You know, he got in there, got struck, get treed, have a coon. Uh, but he was a completely different dog than a night hunt. He he knew when he was at a night hunt, and you know he had that little give that little extra. You know, get off by himself. Uh, you know, he, back in them days, it wasn't a big deal to be split all the time. So he would you know he'd tree with another dog and. Uh, but he just, you know, I had people that hunted with him night after night and then spectate me in a night hunt and say, you know, what's the deal with this dog? I'd never seen this out of him before. I said, we're in a night hunt. I said, he knows the difference. Isn't that something? Some of those dogs, I got a blue tick female at the house right now. You take her out by herself. She looks pretty common. I mean, she trees plenty of coons and, and, and does a good job. But man, when you take her to a night hunt, it's like she turns it up a notch. Yep. Yeah. It's, I, I've had dogs like that in the past, so I know what you're talking about. Was he good about having coons? Good about having coons. Very seldom took minus points. If he if he got a minus point, it was usually my fault. Yeah. What kind of strike dog was he? Uh, good track dog. He was he's a dog. If he was if he was running a track with a chop mouth, you could treat him on the first locate. If he was running with a ball mouth, you better let him locate three times and and then treat him. Uh, like I say, he was a whale of a tree dog. You know, hundred twenty thirty bark a minute tree dog, slobber mouth. Uh, he had a pretty good clear mouth on him good, too. Good clear mouth on him. You could hear him a long way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was one of those. If I'd have, if I'd have been thinking back in the day, then you probably could have talked me into talked me into hunting one of those black and tans. <laughs> you know, black and tans the only breed that of of the hounds I have never owned. Yeah. It's the only one, and I don't know why. I've always I've always liked looking at them. I've hunted with several good ones. Um, you know, it just seems like the timing's always off. You you end up with um you know something else at the time and 
something comes available. That's just one of the, the dogs that I've never had. But I always like the looks of them, uh, like the markings on them. I like the people that hunt black and tans. The whole I don't know why I never made the yeah, black, made black that and tan, happen. Black and tan world's a good good world to be in. It's I've made a million friends and my, my children have made good friends of it. And, you know, they gave a talk today about the black and tan yearbook that if you ever got in trouble anywhere you could open your yearbook and find somebody to help you anywhere in the country and there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, I, that's what I always remember about the Black and Tan Association was that yearbook was just thick. And it was big. And, you know, the the people that hunt black and tans are very loyal to their breed association. And uh, I think I came to black and tan days the first time in the mid-80s probably. And it was amazing. You know, you pull into Charlie Brown Park when it was over in Flora. Yep. And uh, you couldn't find a parking space. You, you, I mean, you you had to walk if you didn't get there early. Campers set up everywhere and things like that. Yeah, that's it's been like that for years. Of course, times have changed in the last two or three years. COVID come in, you know, we skipped a year and it just never bounced back yet. But it's, you know, they've got a good turnout this year. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's get back to Juice a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about him. Tell him, tell me about Juice's. First of all, what have what have you accomplished with Juice? Why have you stuck with that? If you're hunting the sun off of him from semen thirty years ago, what was it about that dog that you want to keep you want to keep reproducing off of that. Yeah, they were they were they were, they were good looking dogs, uh, good tree dogs, uh, balanced you know track dogs. Uh, pretty pretty much trash free. Don't have a lot of trash with them. They're they're intelligent dogs too. I mean, Juice. I, I used to take him to the hunts. And, you know, I could put him in a pen at Winter Classic or Autumn Oaks and tell him to get in a pen. He'd hop the gate, get in a pen, tell him to stay there. He'd stay there all week. Never had to time up. Somebody won't look at him. You holler at him. He'd jump the fence, stand there, and let him look at him. Yeah. You know, pull it, pull him off a tree, and unsnap him. He'd follow you out of the woods. And you know, people wish their kids would mind like like he did. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. So what what kind of what kind of bloodline do you go back to? He was a direct son of Ward's Bow, who was a popular stud owned by Ed Abel. Uh, he was out of Tennessee, Judge. His mother was Sanders Hank, and which was uh, Guthrie's Deacon, uh, Tennessee Fiddler, which back in them days were the popular. So he had all the popular dogs in him at that time. Yeah. So I'm, you know, kind of with him and the seamen, I'm kind of bringing some of that old blood back, crossing back with some of the modern stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm getting the type of dog that I enjoy hunting. You know, I'm the one that feeds them, so I'm the only one that really has to be happy with them. Yeah. Yeah, but the results are are real good on him. Did you raise him from a pup? No, bought him bought him at Walker Days off a off a trade trade row years ago. He was <laughs> he he was a had a Grand Show Champion title on him. I'd seen him in the magazines, and and uh, a guy come and told me about him and said, if you want a tree dog, that's a dog you need to get a hold of. And so we we bought him, and me and Tim Whitaker bought him together, and then I took him home and hunted him a few nights, and I liked him, so I bought Tim's out and. Rest is history, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I got to track down Tim while I'm here. Tim and I go back farther than you right. and I do, uh, back to the mid-'80s. And uh, But, yeah, Tim Tim's made his mark, too, with his smoky, smoky dogs. Smoky and, line. And, that's, <clears throat> and since that time, you know, talking about the smoky line, I kind of fizzled out of hunting there for three or four years with my son and stuff. He wanted to get hunting, so I bought – well, I took the Smoky Three dog that Tim had and just hunted him for a while. Then Tim decided he wanted to sell him, so I bought him and raised a couple of litters. So I've kind of incorporated the Smoky line of dogs into my dogs too. So about everything I've got's got the, the Juice line, the Smoky line. I've got some of the modern stuff, the Batman line of dogs. So which one of those Smoky dogs was Monkey Faced? That was the original Smoky. The original kind of, Smoky. Smoky uh, one, yeah. Yep, and that's the one that that I drew. I used to hunt a little red bone female. Uh, in the night hunts back in the 80s and and uh, that's when uh, Tim and I met and I remember him hunting that monkey face mm -hmm. dog that was smoky the yeah. original smoky little, dog little bit of a high tan dog yeah yep yeah high tan and and monkey face it was and uh but he he's really he, does he throw that in his pups are you getting that now very seldom what causes uh, that I don't know that's just something that's been crossed back in him years ago I know I raised a litter out of him 
Uh, it was just about the time I bought the juice dog, I'd bred a female to Smokey. And out of the litter, I had one female that was called, kind of marked like him. And she she turned out to be a real good dog. I believe she got run over or something happened to her. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the only pup, the litters I've seen out of him, that was the only pup i ever seen that had that high tan on him. Tim ever mentioned getting anything out of him like that? No. Any of the high I, tan stuff? No, I don't. I don't, and I don't think, I don't remember some of the pups that I've seen at Tim's house ever have anything like that. Yeah. That must be recessive. Mm -hmm. It must be a recessive gene in there I mean, somewhere. I know that monkey, the monkey face itself, I, you see, still sticks out a little bit. But the, as far as the high tan on the legs or something, I don't, I've yeah. never seen that since then. Yeah, you can usually spot a, spot a smoky, an older smoky dog because they, they have more brown on their mm -hmm. face, you know, than, than a lot of. Uh, you know, some of the other lines of black and tans, like the Wagners and stuff like right. that. You know, the Smokies always had a little more tan, but the, the whole full monkey face thing was, uh, was a rare thing to see. Hey, I want to talk to you about coon hunting lights. Over the course of my hunting career, I have had a lot of lights, starting with the night light, six volt, the wheat light with the uh, gel cell battery and the 5100 Head, but the first cool light I ever had was a Cajun, and it was a Sweet 16. The battery was a big square box, and it was worn on a belt on your side. It weighed about a gazillion pounds, and, and it, there's a reason why the old coon hunters have limps and have bad backs. Fast forward to 2022, we go around the hunts, we see all these cap lights, everything weighs 18 ounces. There's enough light modules on there to land aircraft. And the components for each light are basically the same. What it really comes down to is the person that puts that light together. At Cajun Lights, L.W. Nixon puts every light together that he sells. I've been using the Cajun Bayou for a couple of weeks now, and I am impressed. This is a simple and highly functional light that is lightweight. And I've spent enough time with L.W. to know that he is going to take special care in putting your light together. Whether you choose a Roguru, the Microgator, the Bayou Light, all high quality. He's got hunting vests over there. The lights attached to the vests. They're interchangeable. I mean, the, the options are endless. You can check it all out at CajunLights.com. LW is going to take care of you over there. Check out Cajun Lights at CajunLights.com. I was about eight when I started coon hunting. How'd you get into it? My dad was a, I liked to hunt. I mean, I lived kind of at the edge of town, had woods behind my house and I spent all my free time. My grandparents had a farm. I was always in the woods. Mm -hmm. My dad was a square dance caller and we went up in, uh, up in Indiana. He called square dances every Saturday night. And a guy, he come to the dances was a coon hunter up there in the Wabash river bottoms. Really? And he, he invited us up and, uh, so Dad would take me up a lot of nights. We'd go up there on Friday night and coon hunt, and then he'd have to turn around and drive back up there the next night and call square dances. And then some guys there around home knew, knew I liked to coon hunt, so I started hunting with them, and and uh, so the the fever hit. Yeah, at eight years old? Yeah, huh? I was about 11 time I really got hunting all the time. had my own dog. I mean, my first dog was a he – was, he was a high-tan dog, too. He was, he was wandering around town. Uh, I, I caught him, took him home, and he, he wasn't much count. But <laughs> <laughs> The first one's just, they never are. No. You know. And I bought another high tan dog off a, of, off a, well, he, he, I didn't know he was going to be a high tan dog. I bought him out of an ad in a, one of the old magazines, had him shipped in here, and he was a high tan dog, and he about twice as old as he was supposed to be, but he, he would tree a coon. And then I got, got my first registered dog and had registered dogs ever since. Yeah, how old do you think that old, that dog was? Yeah, well, he's supposed to be in six or seven. Uh, he got he got down on me, took him to the vet, and they said he had heartworms. He said he's more like eleven or twelve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had that same thing happen. You know, I messed. I don't know how many hounds I had there when I was younger, but when I was seventeen, uh, there was a there was a man in our community named John Harris, and he had a he had a dog out of. Uh, Hearn's Red Eagle Dick, and uh, his Rock Creek Charlie Pride was that dog's name. And John was get he was probably about seventy, and and he just couldn't go anymore. And he knew I loved to hunt. He just gave me that old dog, and that's when the bug 
I knew I enjoyed coon hunting, but when Charlie came along and he could act, I mean, we, we'd go hunting every night and we might tree a coon once or twice a week mm -hmm. with the caliber of dogs we had. And I still remember the first night I turned him loose as frosty and I met a buddy of mine out of woods. He was already there. He already had his old Queenie dog in there. Uh, running the track and I cut Charlie into her and he went in there and struck a track and went on past and got treed and had a coon you know yeah those 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 first dogs that you get you remember them that that actually it's like my dog treed a coon yep remember, remember the days I mean you just couldn't wait for you know I, I went through a lot of dogs yeah and so, I mean they were all had a good point or two about them but I just never had a complete dog till I was you no, know, I, I bought a pup in 78, and uh, he, he turned in to be a real nice dog. I think I was too young to realize what I had at the time, and mm -hmm. by the time I realized what I had, I was, you know, he was getting old. I, I campaigned him, needed a win to be a grand knight when he, when he died, but, you know, he was, he was an outstanding hound after I started hunting him. I mean, just the dogs I put him up against and won against it, but I say that's part of being a kid, I guess. How would you, how would you have been in 78? Uh, 13. Yeah, 13 years old in 78. And uh, what was he out of? You remember? Yeah, I. Uh, he was off of a dog called Shaker Hill George who went back to a grandson of Tall Timber Roy, which my first registered black and tan pup was a direct son of Tall Timber Roy, who was a, a Bloodworth bred dog down in Tennessee. Uh, she got killed by a car when she wasn't, wasn't very old. And I bought a couple of more. Young dogs off of Tall Timber Roy. Well, one pup and one grand pup off Tall Timber Roy. And then they ended up buying this pup. I was out in, in Ohio and found this pup off a of, off a of Shaker Hill George. And the mother was off a of Screaming Eagle and Eats Bruiser. And uh, the pups wasn't ready to go yet, but the guy was coming to Autumn Oaks that year. What was the dog's name? Dick the Bruiser. Uh, I, uh, what 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 what? Bru Eats, Eats Bruiser. Eats Black Bruiser. Eats Black Bruiser. Yeah. I was going to say Dick the Bruiser was a wrestler. Yeah, he was a wrestler. He was a big time wrestler, he was a wrestler back wrestler in the day. Terrible. Yeah, I used to go see him on Friday night. So. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I've, got, I've got his autograph too at home. So. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, no, I really do have his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it. I believe it. But, he was uh, big in Indiana, Dick yeah, the Bruiser yeah, he's from, was from Indiana. Yeah, that's why it caught my that's why it caught my attention because I thought you said Dick the Bruiser, yeah, and I they, thought somebody named a dog after a wrestler. They they wrestled about once or twice a month in Terre Haute. Yeah, he's not a wrestler. He's a wrestler. Wrestler. He's a wrestler. He, he big a, time wrestler. Dick was a brawler. Yeah, he was. But uh, each, each Bruiser was was a big big influence back in in the seventies. Uh huh. Uh, and they br they brought him to Autumn Oaks. I bought him, picked him up over there. And, uh, you know, he, of course, back then, you know, we didn't even start hunting dogs till he was a year old. Uh, isn't you know, that something? Today, these guys want these dogs running a tree when they're seven, eight months old. Let's, let's talk about that in a okay. minute, how it's changed, how, how it's changed from back in the day. But tell us, finish, tell us about the well, dogs. Well, then, you know, you take him out and play with him, but you didn't do a whole lot. And, I, you know, he was 13, 14 months old, and just one night, we, we was coon hunting with some old dogs, and he just went over here and treated a coon by himself. Yeah. And the minute, minute he treed, you know, he was a pull pressure tree dog from that, that moment on. Uh, but, you know, to, today, I mean, a guy had a dog tree six or seven months old. He really had something. Yeah. Remember so I, did you, your pup treed at 13, 14 months old. What was he doing prior to that? Just going out there and messing around pretty much. And it's just like that night the just light bulb night, came on. just walked over the hill down there in the woods, started treeing. Other dogs were out hunting. and you know, He had a slick tree, but he treed. And, I was going to ask you if he had a coon. And we turned him loose again, and he treed with the old dogs the next tree. We, I, I climbed a tree as an old uh, uh, wild cherry tree in a fence row, and I shook the coon out. And he never looked back. <laughs> oh, man. But I did have a son out of him. I, actually, the first litter of pups I ever raised out of him. You know, at six months old, you know, he was running a tree in his own coon. Started about five months old. And uh, I hunted him all that season. Treated a lot of coon with him. Laid him up after season went out. And by spring, he he wasn't worth a count for anything. Hmm. Like he didn't know what to do. I ended up selling him for a bird dog. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So what do you think the differences are? I mean, back in the day, like the time when we're talking about 70s and 80s, you could go to a night hunt and there would be 
there would be blue ticks and black and tans and red bones. I mean, the, the, all the colors yep. were there. They were all all present. And the, the hunts were full. The bench shows were full. Yeah, e every breed represented. Yeah, I mean, it it wasn't uncommon. I mean, what what you go to a club hunt and there'd be a bench show, and the bench show would last two hours. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have forty or fifty entries in the bench show. Classes for each one of the breeds. Yep, all six breeds would be there. Mm -hmm. Best male and best female show. There'd be six dogs up there. Yeah, yeah. And then the night hunts would have the night hunts for fifty, sixty dogs a hunt. I was getting ready to say R sixty. RQE would be a hundred and twenty or thirty dogs a hunt. Yeah, buddy. Yep, for sure. How do you think it was different back then than it is is now? Ah, uh, just dogs were different. They, of course, back then, then the dogs packed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you didn't talk a lot because when dogs barked, you kind of had to listen because it was a a race to see who get first tree. I mean, and, you know, the, it's funny you look at the ads back then. Well, so-and-so made a night champion with two firsts and a seventh or eighth or ninth. Yeah. And now he, they're three firsts or two firsts and a second. Now, of course, now they're just cast wins. But, right. But even just a few years ago when they were the old format, you know, two firsts and a second, first and two seconds. Mm -hmm. and, and then some of them dogs make night champion. You know, they may have 10 places before they ever got their first place win. So Back in the day. Back in the day, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, had a, I had a pile of, you know, like fourth and fifth place trophies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Chasing and, it. And the hunts, you know, they gave full set of trophies. Yeah. First through tenth. And I wish I still had all my old trophies. Have you still got yours? I've got a few. Uh, I had everything at my parents' house when they passed away and we sold the place. I had no place to put them, and and I gave a few of them away to some organizations to change the tops on them, but a lot of stuff got, just got thrown in the burn pile. Check out Dogs Are Treated at dogsartreed.com. You can find Paws Are Protected, Dogs Are Hydrated, the highest quality leashes and tie-outs in the industry. Great customer service. It's owned by Houndsman, gear built by Houndsman dogsartreed.com use our promo code hxp 20 percent off at checkout and get 20 percent off your order the bills are paid let's take this one home here's jeff wood to finish this one up well getting back to how things have changed i mean why was it back in the day i mean it wasn't if you go to a hunt today and it's not red bone days and there's somebody there with a red bone. I mean, it's kind of uncommon. And same mm -hmm. thing could be said with black and tan. You know, you're seeing a lot of, you still see quite a few English dogs, blue ticks here and there, but a lot of Walker dogs. And somebody, somebody shows up with a black and tan, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of unusual yeah, for anymore. a competition hunt. And I, I don't hunt the hunts like I do, but still it's, it's just, I mean, they're, they're not the hunters out there to start with the, I don't think the the timbers out there for four people to hunt in. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just, I guess time has taken its toll. Yeah. Well, you've missed, you've had some walkers too. Yeah, I've had a couple of walker dogs. And why do you think that the, why do you think the black and tans seem like they've fallen behind or have they, or is that a perception? Because you just don't, you just don't see them. I mean, right. when you go to the super stakes or you go someplace mm -hmm. like that, it's walker dogs. I mean, I think part of it's genetics. I mean, they, they bred these do walker dogs to, you know, I mean, honestly, to probably be a little superior dog. I, and I, I've hunted, drawed a lot of walker dogs. You know, I've been beat by walkers. I've beat walkers. But, you know, just the numbers alone, I mean, I don't know what, what it is, 100 to 1 for a black dog for every, every walker dog. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in sheer numbers, they're just going to have an advantage. Yeah. Uh, I always felt like that the, the walker guys were a little more in tune with, they, they did a and I'm talking about, I mean, I'm sitting here wearing a plot shirt for crying out loud. So, but you know, it's, it's one of those deals where the Walker guys were more in tune with breeding to fit that scorecard. And, exactly. And those they bred winners. for a competition though. Yeah. I mean, if, if you go over here and, and talk to these people at black and tan days this weekend, a lot of them guys, black and tan days is the only hunt they'll hunt all year. Mm -hmm. They won't be at another hunt. They, they coon hunt, they're pleasure hunters. Where you go to Walker Days, them guys, you know, they were to hunt last week. They'll be at a hunt next week. They'll be hunting the week after that. They're, they're running for truck tickets. Yeah, them, they're doing. Them dogs are, you know, they're making them for the scorecard. Right, right. 
Yeah, it's just it's just uh, and so when you when you take that into consideration, I mean it's easier to find a dog that can compete right. at that level. And now if you can find one that's black and tan, then you really got something. Mm -hmm. I mean, you make a big splash quick. Yep. So that's kind of you know we had that big country dog, right? And that's what set him apart. It's like where did this dog come from? And um, just because he was a different color, it was kind of like holy crap! There's something besides a you know tricolored Walker dog <coughs> that's doing something. And the same thing would happen with a red bone or a black yep. and tan. But it's it's always been my experience. I think that what I've seen is, and I don't fault him for it because I'm a traditional type guy. You know, I like I like the old time stuff. I mm -hmm. like I like tradition and things like that. And some of these old time black and tan breeders just won't move out. They don't care what anybody else is doing. This is what we this is what we like. This is what we want to hunt, and we're going to keep doing yeah. it. I mean, some some of the guys are hunting the same type of dog today they hunted thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. No no faster, no slower. You know, start the same, but. That's what they're happy with. And they're, like I say, they're, they're the one to feed them. So. Well, you mentioned, you know, you're breeding on juice. Right. That dog was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So how's how are his pups competing in today's world? Are they competitive or are they being are they being competition hunted? I, I'm just, well, the, the male dog I've got right now is the first one I've, I, I don't raise a lot of pups out of him, but, but yeah, he's. You know, I just started him. I need a need one more win to be a night champion. But he's <clears throat> he's been bred a little bit. He's got that some Batman in him, so he's got that little bit more of an independent streak that modern dogs are. You know, get by themselves. And, mm -hmm. uh, I've got a she's not really a sister. She's the same breeding, just flip flop. She's she's juice breeding, and she's out of Batman with juice breeding on the bottom side. Uh, we've been real successful with her the last couple of years. Uh, I don't know what she's anything super but she's you know she's a coon treer she gets by herself and and when she when she's on she's on she's pretty tough to beat but she gets by herself and treats a lot of coons and you know she's been uh, she was a black and tan, purina black and tan winner this year she won high scoring female to autumn oaks last two years ago uh, got in the top 100 at the world hunt last year but mm -hmm. you know, she she's she can be competitive with anything out there i believe yeah well, you never did tell. I, I think I cut you off and switched direction before you told told us what all you've won with with the old juice dog. Yeah, and he wasn't. I didn't win a lot of big hunts. Uh, some Illinois state hunt. He was high scoring black and tan to world hunt in '92. Uh, Governor's Cup. I just I just never pushed him into into big hunts. Probably like I should have. Mm -hmm. But uh, is he a Hall of Fame dog in no, the Black and Tan Association? No, not yet. I. We were just talking about that the other day, and they changed the the parameters for that. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think uh, I'm going to get him nominated or something next year. I mean, you know, he sired a little over 400 pups, I think. There's I don't remember what his records are off, off the top of my head, but there's a lot of a lot of your dogs you see out there today. If you go back far enough, he's he, he's in their pedigrees. Yeah. Yeah, some of the top dogs. Because yeah. I'll I'll still look at those pedigrees and stuff, and I'll see that juice dog, and mm -hmm. and you know I know right where it came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many how many generations? Uh, I wonder how many generations that would be if it was thirty years ago. They they'd probably still be showing up in some of those six and seven generations if it was just. Yeah, he's still. I mean, there's still a few dogs. Somebody will advertise a dog and. I'll say I'll see a dog maybe back in his third generation. I'll say, well, I know that's a a grand pup of him or you know, yeah. great grand pup of him. So, of course, I'm kind of a student of pedigrees anyhow. So yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I love pedigrees. What? Why do you? Why do? Okay, let's just talk about that because we this podcast goes out all over the world. We've got people in the West that that don't keep pedigrees on their dogs. They don't register right. stuff. Why do you study pedigrees? That's a good topic. Uh, I just. Think pedigrees an influence, and don't get me wrong. There's there's great dogs that got terrible pedigrees. Mm -hmm. Don't even know what their pedigree is. But and there's there's uh, terrible dogs that got great pedigrees. Exactly. But <laughs> a pedigree is a foundation. This this whole dog breeding business is a crapshoot, in my opinion. Yeah. But you've got to start somewhere. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And if you've got a dog with ability that's got the pedigree to behind it, 
same way in the horse business. I'm, you know, wearing the horses too. I'm, I'm same way in the horses. And you know, when I was, well, I was single, and even with my wife now. I mean, you know, she come home, and there's pedigrees scattered all over the house. Yeah. And I'm, you know, this dog to this dog. So you're like a pedigree junkie on horses and yeah. and. Yeah. Dogs, black I mean, and I've, I've got all the horse books. I've got all the dog books. <laughs> I've got a picture of that dog, or I've got a picture of that horse. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think? You started to touch on it there. It's a foundation. So as a as a breeder, how do you use pedigrees to choose crosses and, and things like that? Well, just, I mean, like some of the dogs I've got now, they've, they've got solid pedigrees. You know, I know... Uh, I just seen a dog advertised the other day. Somebody put an ad on him on one of the dog sites. You know, I knew probably three quarters of the dog on his pedigree. Mm -hmm. I mean, and most of them I'd even hunted with. So, I mean, if I'm going down the road wanting to breed to something, you know, this dog would, he would catch my attention. For one, he's, he's a coon dog. For one, I know I know what what's all behind him. I mean, mm -hmm. I know them dogs. They've they got the traits I desire or, or I don't desire. I mean, if I wouldn't like him, I would wouldn't use him. But right. But you know, there's there's history behind him that says he could be a possible good sire. Yeah, he's got the genetic he got makeup. The, got the genetic makeup. Yeah, to do to do his part. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, the whole genetic thing is is um, very much understudied, especially among coon hounds and things like that. If you get into if you get into cattle farming and you get into raising hogs and stuff, those guys are dialed in on genetics. But you know, we're with with a coon hound, we're breeding for so many. Exactly. You know, if you're breeding a, a a cow, you're breeding for milk production, or you're breeding a beef cow for beef. How much show, meat show you cattle, can pack on the bone, or show cow for hair or whatever you want yeah you know, horses are the same way you breed them for speed draft horse you want size uh, you know quarter ho quarter horse you're wanting either a headset or a to be cow or something you know we're breeding these coon dogs they want they got to look a certain way they've got to run a track a certain way they've got a tree a certain way they've got to hunt with other dogs or hunt by themselves and there's I mean, we're throwing trying to throw so much stuff into one animal i think it's 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 more demanding than I raised retrievers for mm -hmm. several years. What I did with those retrievers, they were never out of pocket. You know, they were they were under my supervision the entire time. And I guess you could say the same thing about hounds to a certain extent, but but they're not. That you know, we've got garments and we've got e collars and we got that sort but that of stuff. That dog's still a mile away doing something. Exactly, he's still a mile away, and and that is what makes it so difficult to come up with, you know, uh, 10 out of 10 of a litter turning out to be top <coughs> coon dogs um, or consistently doing it. And the people that do, that can do it just absolutely amaze me. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, some people's got a gift for certain dogs. I mean, they can take up anything and make a dog out of it. I've got to have a little bit of talent in them to <laughs> bring it too. out, I guess. I was just talking about this the other day. Yeah, we we're, we we're having this discussion about uh, the last several years. I've had a pretty high success rate with pups that I keep and raise turn out to be, you know, good to above average coon tree and dogs. Um, but I think what it is, is I just finally learned what I liked and I recognized what I can work with. So I take the easier out, right. you know, I, I stay away from that dog that I've had that maybe I don't know about and I look for those traits and those pups that I do like. And so it helps me be a better trainer when I know what I like and when I've done it enough and you can see, Hey, I can work with that. I can work with that. There's some things that I see and it's just like, I'm not going to work with that. <laughs> I won't do it. You know, yep. sometimes it's just stuff I don't like in a dog. And there's a, there's a spot, whether it's, looks or something they do in the woods one night or something i'm done it's time for them to go go somewhere else to for me you know what it is for a lot of it is for me kennel manners yeah you know if i i've never i've never liked a dog that that paces is i'd call them turd grinders 
uh, that just can't stand still, can't can't just chill out in the kennel. Uh, you know, if it's barking or it's pacing or, or anything like that. I had a pup here uh, that I just just got rid of. Super potential. I mean, this little pup took a bear track and ran a bear track and uh, uh, bayed with the older dogs at six months old. He was a hunting machine. I'd turn him around, loose around the house, and he'd be gone. I mean, he was not mm -hmm. staying around the house. Like he got me in trouble with the neighbors. <laughs> but uh and i'm talking a mile and a half away my my you know my neighbors up there right. would get pictures of him on the trail cam at, at five and six months old and um but the little idiot he was staying inside his doghouse and he was pissing in his doghouse and the only thing i can figure is i had a male dog right next to him so it was he was kind of intimidated dominance yeah. wise and uh, first time it happened, I mean, it was this past winter. I walk out there, and it's like, man, is that doghouse leaking? And I fixed up the doghouse, and I tarped it because I, I didn't have another doghouse to put on there. So I tarped it and uh, went back out a week or so later, and the suck that doghouse was act actually had urine standing in it. And I thought, well, you got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. That's after I cleaned it out, and I thought, that's a deal breaker. And I he ended up – I ended up – a guy contacted me. He's like, "Hey, you know where there's just a pup like this?" And I and I said, or bred a certain way. He said, "Just so happen I have one." And I, I told him exactly what he was doing. He says, "What do you want for him?" I said, "If you want him, you can come and get him because he's not going to stay here." There's just certain things that are deal breaking yeah. for me. And I've got I've got a female. She's not like that, but just in the kennel. And uh, you know, she's she. I think she got that little extra, and that's the only thing. Right now, save, saving her. She just, yeah. I mean, she, she's not crazy, but she just, she got a habit or two that I just kind of hits me wrong. But like I say, we're, we're working through it. I mean, it, she could be worse. I've, I've had yeah. worse. I, yeah. There's a dog I had, you know, talking about dogs in the kennel. And here a few years ago was outstanding dog. But he was, you know, his just back and forth. And it just drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 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 I had him for another guy, and I just, I just couldn't handle it. You know, he, he and he was a, could have been a winning sucker, I think. He's well, the guy that got this pup for me, he's sending me videos of this old dude out there trying coons by himself, rolling in there, big low cates, and just blowing it down. Yep. I asked him. I said, "Hey, have you had this problem?" He's like, "Nope, haven't had any issues." You know, but and those are the ones that I used to sit back and I'd be like, "Man, I wish I'd have kept that dog." But now anymore, but, I'm just like. He's in a better place. Yep, that's exactly right. He is in a better place. Yep. No regrets. No regrets. Well, hey, tell me about work. The, I want to talk about you working for Bill Boatman. Okay. <laughs> Bill Bo First, tell our, tell everybody who Bill Boatman is because well, there's yeah. going to be some people who are listening a lot of guys don't, don't know. When I, was, when I was a kid and started hunting, the Bill Boatman catalog was like your Christmas wish book. Yeah. Uh, you know, coming to mail, I don't know, two or three times a year out in Bainbridge, Ohio. So Bill Boatman was a dog supply guy. He was also a big black and tan breeder. Run full page ads in the magazines every month. Always stood two or three stud dogs. <clears throat> so he had a stud dog called Screaming Eagle. And we had a female come in heat. We gonna wanted to breed to him. So we went out there and took her out there on on Saturday, I believe. Me and my dad and a neighbor. And Eagle he could he couldn't get her bred at the time. The guy said, Well, uh, if you want to leave her here, I'll, uh, we'll try to get her bred. So I, wa I wanted to go hunting out there. And, and uh, in Ohio, you couldn't hunt on Sunday nights at that time. And Junior Ralston was a kennel manager. And he was from Terre Haute, which is just where you worked at, just across the state line from me. And he told my dad if I wanted to stay out there for a couple of weeks, he'd bring me home because he had to come back to Terre Haute. He, he, he agreed to let me stay out there. So I, I was 12 years old at the time. I spent two weeks out there, <laughs> helped, you know, helped take care of dogs, got a coon hunt. Hang on night. a second. You were 12 years old at the time. 12 years old. You go, you'd, you rode out there with your dad. Yeah. My dad, and my neighbor took me out there. Okay. Or not my neighbor, but the guy we hunted with. So when you, your dad showed up at home without you, what'd your mom say? Well, 
<laughs> good, good, luckily, we called her before he left me out there. <laughs> okay. We, we, had, right. we had to get her permission. All right. I got now, you I don't now. want everybody out there thinking I'm a mommy's boy because I'm, I'm not. But, <laughs> but she, anyhow, she he laid, left me some money to buy a pair of pants and a shirt. The mom sent me a care package, and, and uh, yeah. I survived the two weeks. And uh, so that's where I bought that buck dog out there years years ago when uh, I've seen him out there to, at a guy's house. And then, so the following summer, when I was 13, uh, they asked me if I wanted to come out there and spend the summer. So well, what did you do? What did you do that two weeks you were out there? I, I just, that, that first two weeks, I just kind of lo- loafed. I helped with pups, and I helped feed dogs. And yeah. Coon, we coon hunted at night, done just everything around there. Uh-huh. So the next year, I spent the whole summer out there and basically worked out there. I mean, I cleaned kennels, fed dogs, fed pups. We, you know, we'd have 10, 12 litters of pups at a time out there. Just of course, p- people come in. You know, you, you'd answer the phone in the office if somebody called, and you always had people stopping in there to go hunting, and I, I'd take them hunting. And so I, I got to, I got a lot of contacts out there when I was. Of course, like I say, I was a, I'm a pedigree nut, and they had files of pedigrees out there. What were counties. some of the dogs that Bill had out there when you were there? At that time, let's see, the Eads Black Bruiser dog I talked about. Yeah. He had had him. He'd he, he'd passed away since then. But at that time, he had Screaming Eagles. Belonged to W. L. Davis from Virginia. They had a dog called Midnight Trouble. Belonged to uh, uh, Sutton up in in uh, Northern Illinois. He was a he was a Wagner bred dog. Had a dog called Trump the Third from Ohio. He was a Wagner bred dog. These are black and tan. These dogs. are all black and tans. Yep. Yeah, Knight Riders Breda. He was a Wagner bred Bloodworth bred dog. He was a he'd been a national grand show champion a couple of years before that a uh, big time bear dog oh mm-hmm. uh, what else did they have in it had a dog called sounder uh davis's black powder they had him they just lost cypress creek jim so there's several good dogs stood out there so let me understand this right bill would would contact these people he brought these dogs into his a, kennel. a lot of the stud dogs were leased yeah yeah, and yeah. he he stood him at stud there at his place. Yeah, he had they had about five or six studs, and then there's probably I don't know looking back what was there fifty females there probably. Mm-hmm. But he had kind of a modern laboratory and kennels and everything up there. Yeah, and so when somebody if somebody wanted to go breed to a top, Bill would go try to find these top of the line. Yeah, he black kept, and tans. I mean, he kind of had his program. He had had them. The studs he had were kind of for his use. But he stood them at public for anybody else too. Yeah, so he would lease it. He'd have the dog under contract, and then people could right. come to Bill Boatman's. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a that's kind of a genius so thing. You, I mean, you could come and breed a Screaming Eagle, and if you got there and you didn't like Screaming Eagle, you could breed a, this dog or or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've got to dig dig around home. I've got pictures with you know all these big stud dogs standing out front on the sidewalk posing them and. Yeah, I, I thought I was something then. Yeah, you said you you were you were mm-hmm. what did you say you were that close to being on the cover? Yeah, I just a half about a eighth of an inch from being on the cover of the Bill Boatman catalog. <laughs> <laughs> but they cut my picture out. <laughs> they had a picture of the dog, and you were on the other yeah, end they of the had leash. A couple of pictures of the dog standing on the tailgate, and I was standing off the side on the leads. So. <laughs> What else did Bill have out there? I, I know, I know, because I remember the Bill Boatman, Bill Boatman catalog. But mm-hmm. he had some, he had some pretty crazy. Uh, actually, it was innovative stuff. He but was I, very innovative for the day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the things I had from him, it was a double, had two lights on top of it, mm-hmm. uh, and one, it was shaped like an oval. Yep. Had a clip on the back, went on the front of your helmet, and you could flip between a floodlight a and, spotlight. and a spotlight. I still got one. Do you really? There's not very many people got them because I wish I still had mine. He, uh, I got one of them, and it was it was a kind of a more of a prototype. Yeah, it never it never did. I don't think he even really hardly put it out. But I've I've got one at home in a in a box. It's brown. Is it brown? Brown. Yep. Yep. It's brown. Got it. Got a old Dynalite, which you know everybody thinks of the Dynalite. They that was a light everybody carried on a six volt or six cell light yep. carried on a strap over your shoulder. So you, when you found them, then you could use that Dynalite to shine them. Had a and it had a charger that you took the lens off and recharged them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, everybody thought he just made stuff for coon hunters. But, you know, them Dynalites were sold to, like, airports and airlines. And, I mean, 
it was it was a big business. Yeah. What other sorts of uh, what other sorts of innovative products did Bill keep over there? Well, you know, they had the the uh, what do they call them Green, Greenbrier coach. You know, they started out with them heavy coach for briars and all that stuff. Uh-huh. You know, he's one of, I think probably one of the first guys with chaps. Uh, you know, he always had somebody bringing bring him something up. Yeah, he was a mover and a shaker yeah. for sure. Always yeah. tried to stay in front. Um, I was trying to. Th- he always had vet supplies. Yeah, vet you, you, you buy supplies, collars. Yeah, leashes. I mean, uh, he's one of the first guys probably come out with the. Yeah, they called it day glow, but it's basically the 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 ni- nylon stuff that we use today. Yeah, and then there were a lot of hand drawn. There were a lot of hand drawn pictures in his catalog, and I remember those yeah. day glow collars. He had a guy. They were the the dog was standing out there, and the hunter was standing back, shining his light, and he had showed, it, showed reflect. Or show, look, showed like reflect. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had. Uh, I'll tell you something else. He had. You could tell he was uh, catering to the dog traders because he had those slide on name plates. Yeah, slide on name plates. Where the, where the collar would thread through two D rings through the name plates and mm-hmm. stuff. That way you could switch them yeah, out. I remember being in. in I, I went to the showroom all the time there in, in town, and you know he had different things mounted, but he had a. Of course, you used to see the guys with the, the name name tag machine, just a little hand. Yeah. Hand. Well, he had a giant machine in there, looked like a big typewriter, but it was, shoot, it was two foot across, and they could just put them plates in there and just type them just like a typewriter. No kidding. Had, had big old bars, stamped them in there. Yeah. They were good ones too, because mm-hmm. it wasn't just a little din. I mean, if I remember right, uh, it did it in reverse, didn't it? So it popped the um, popped the name plate out. Yeah, they, it, it, it was. You could see it on the other side. I remember. I do yeah. remember that. Yeah. 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 It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Those were those were good nameplates back in those well, days. Bill back then had the Fruitdale Sportsman's Club, and it was a big it was a big trade day uh, swap meet type thing. I remember going to that out there when I was out there and swapping guns and dogs. And yeah. Swim races and field trials and you name it, they had it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You ever think you think we'll ever get back to those days? No, I'm, I'd like to. <laughs> they, they were good times. I have no regrets. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, it was it was that's quite an adventure for a twelve, thirteen year old kid. Yeah, I was. I mean, well, just the year I picked that dog up. You know, my parents took me to. All, that was the last. I think that was the last year of Autumn Oaks at Greencastle, Indiana. Mm-hmm. My dad took me over on, there again, took me over on Friday, kicked me out. And the guy was going to, he had arrangements made for a guy to bring me home Sunday on his way through. No kidding. I, I had a little bitty tent and about 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and a dog and 13 years old. Times have changed, haven't they've, they? They've changed, yeah. So let's let's compare <clears throat> like black and tan days. <clears throat> uh, we started to touch on it. How many how many entries did they have at Black and Tan Days last night in the Black Hunt? I don't know what they had in total. I kind of glanced up there a while ago before, I, before you called me and seen what the thing was. I know they had, I think, 15 or 16 RQE casts. But I, I can't tell you what their total number was last night. Yeah. But I know, you know, last year I think we had 140 or 50 dogs the first night and 120 the second night were – Back in them days, it would have been 350 the first night. Yeah, I brought 300 a walk- the second night. I brought a walker dog to black in 10 days, probably. Well, you hunted with Joe, that mm-hmm. old Joe dog I had. Um, brought him over here, and I forget how many entries there were, like 275 entries. Or yeah. I mean, it was crazy back in the early 90s. How well, many it, entries? Even, were even all black and tan hunt back in the days was, you know, 200, 250 dogs just for the all black. Just, uh, Big get together hunt. Yeah, yeah. Which is why everybody come to Black and Tan Days. Yep, that's right. It, it, does it still start? Used to it, people start rolling in on Monday, mm-hmm. and guys would just hunt and fellowship and eat and tell old stories all week long. Yeah, it's there's still some a couple of guys come early. I, I was here Wednesday. Uh, there were maybe forty people here Wednesday night when I first got here. But they had the Champions Classic hunt, which has just been added the last few years, but. There wasn't just wasn't very many outside people in here yet. Yeah, back in the day though, man. But if you came on Wednesday, there were already several hundred people. Yeah, on the grounds, vendors were already open. Yeah, it was. It was. I always called it. The, it was. I felt like 
the biggest event of the year for just people that that came together. It wasn't it wasn't really, um, you know, you weren't competing all week. It was just a it was like a big family reunion. Family reunion, reunion. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, what else we we miss anything? Well, I I think we've covered a lot. I think we have too. I think we have too. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I'm glad you. Glad you gave me a shout. Like I say, I <laughs> picked up that phone. I thought, who's this? From? Yeah, I had to sneak I had to sneak attack. Yeah, I called yeah. you on Andy Canada's Call, phone. Called me on Andy's phone. And yeah. I figured it was him. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to go try to find Tim Whitaker. Yeah. Get him Good on luck. here. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jeff, we uh, appreciate you sitting down. I think everybody's going to enjoy the walk down memory lane, I mean, thinking about working for Bill Boatman and still breeding off the old juice dog, that's pretty amazing stuff, man. Yeah, you know, it's it's been a it's been a fun ride. Yeah. And you you're not how old are you? Fifty six? Just turned fifty seven. Fifty seven. So you're still a young man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're in good shape. Good shape, still. So. Yep. Still get through the woods good. Yeah. Yeah. Can't hear worth a lick. Can't hear, can't see, but <laughs> Well, Jeff, until next time, buddy, you follow your hound. Remember in the pre-roll where I mentioned a story about black and tans, gangsters, and moonshine? Here it is. All right. We, we, the best conversations always happen when the microphone's off. You're good. Don't okay. Worry. We'll catch this. You got to tell me, you got to tell this story about the movie. Okay. <clears throat> so... I was in my family's house one day, and my dad went in the, in the house and come back out and said, I was wanting on the telephone. I asked him who it was, and he didn't know. So I went in there and talked to these people. Well, he did, he did say it's somebody from some movie studio. So I went in there, and I figured it was a joke. And they were, <laughs> they were, they were from a movie studio. They were shooting uh, an episode of The Untouchables, which used to be a TV series about Al Capone and, or, Dillinger, Al Capone, I guess it was, and back in the moonshine days. Bootleggers. Bootleggers. Yeah. Yeah. So I I talked to these people, and they said, hey, we, we need some coonhounds for, for this episode, and they have to be black and tan coonhounds. So somebody, somebody gave, gave us your name to get a hold of. So I said, well, yeah, I've got, I've got black and tans. Did you ever find out who gave them your name? Never, never did. I mean, how do you go from having a movie studio in Chicago to finding Jeff Wood in Edgar, Illinois? Yeah, I don't know, but, Edgar but they County, did. Illinois. Huh. So, long story short, we got to talking, and I said, yeah, I can come up with some dogs. And they said, how many you need? Well, how many have you got? I think I ended up taking three or four dogs up. And uh, so then we got to talking, and they said, well, you know, we need this, we need that, and we need some pigs, and we need this. Cause this, this episode was supposed to be set in, in Kentucky. Yeah. Well, this was being filmed in the outskirts of Chicago in a nature preserve. Come to find <laughs> what I found out later. But you drive you know, off the main highway and you're in a nature preserve. It looks like you're in Kentucky. Log cabins and log barns. And So I took a trailer full of hogs and, <laughs> and a dog box full of coon dogs. And you have any chickens on board? No, I didn't. Somebody had chickens. I, I didn't ha have the chickens. But we had chickens in the movie. Yeah. So I had to put these hogs in the hog pen, big old 400-pound sows. And, and so, so a couple of the parts we needed, they they done a recording with, with the older man and old woman. They were supposed to be the parents of these bootlegging boys. and So I had to make old Juice lay down between them, just where he was sitting on the porch, and the revenuers were there questioning him. And So in, in, in the movie, I mean, you wouldn't see me, but I was just around the corner of the barn telling Juice, stay, 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 and he just <laughs> laid there. So then we had to do another scene where one of the guys was walking out of the woods and he had supposed to have his dog walking alongside of him and the revenuers confronted him and had a shootout. And, but they had to get this dog to bark. And so he had a little, I put a little bitty fine cord on juice to make him where this guy could step on it and keep him from taking off. Yeah. But we, we couldn't get him to bark. I said, well, how are we going to get this dog to bark? And of course they had their camera with a big bulletproof thing on it because this guy had to shoot the old lever action rifle at the camera, uh -huh. but they had them microphone booms and they had one of them big old fuzzy microphone covers. Yeah. And I took that microphone cover and I got to shaking it and squalling like a coon in the background. 
to get him to barking. So he, this guy's standing on his leash so he can't go anywhere, and he's he's barking and, and like he's wanting to get get after somebody. And, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it made, he made it look like he was trying to get after the the revenue after the revenues. Yeah. Oh man, that's awesome. And we were like I say, it looked like it was Kentucky, and I think I spent two days up there. I mean, and it, it was it was quite an experience because. The movie star set right next to you. You, they, you ate out of their catering bus with them. What kind of? What kind of? Uh, who were the stars on? You remember? Oh, uh, yeah, I can. I mean, I still see them in shows. I can't. I can't tell you tell you what their name was. A couple of guys have really been popular. So you can remember you can remember coon dog names, but you can't remember movie star names. No, no. <laughs> I, I've got pictures at home. I can I can show you. I see them in a movie. I say, hey, I was you know ate with that guy, or I was one of the guys in that movie. But yeah, I can't remember. I can't tell you what their name is right offhand. Like I say, a couple, couple of them were pretty popular later on. See, that's something I didn't know. I didn't know Juice was a movie star. Yeah, he got, a, he got about a split second. But yeah. it's, it's funny because you know, we filmed quite a bit of time actual filming, and for maybe five seconds is all he was. I, I used to have the video there at home somewhere. I'd like to see that, just see what, put it in context. That's pretty cool. I'm glad I had. I'm glad I <laughs> turned the recorder back on for that one, Jeff. Yeah, we're gonna have to put this in in the bon- was, bonus segment. That was one of my first and only trips to Chicago. Uh, I don't blame you there. We could go. We could record another podcast about hauling dogs through Chicago on my end. But all right, man, that'll do it. All right, good Th- enough. Thanks, 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 Jeff. And that will do it for this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and listening, spending your time with us here on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network. Big announcement, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, May 18th, Heath Hyatt is rolling out his own show. It's going to be good. You're going to be surprised at the material he's going to cover and how deep he's going to go into training issues and and just being a better houndsman. You're going to love it. Make sure you're checking us out over on the Apple Podcast platform. Leave us a review. Leave us a rating. We love you. Thanks for tuning in. And now... You follow your hounds, and I'll follow mine.